so while we're f finishing that out, just to give you, this will be a hybrid format course. I think as you've probably seen from the description, we're going to be doing some lectures about technologies for single molecule sequencing, single protein profiling, bioinformatics tools, some of the latest advances in spatial and single molecule methods. There'll be a few guest lectures. Uh, I'll be doing some, Tay will be doing some. We'll do a quick intro today of who are we? Some of you might already know, but we'll do a quick review. And then also what are some of the goals for the course, but it will be hybrid. So for those of you in uh, in Houston and Methodist, there'll be obviously some of you can do a lot by Zoom for some of the computational work. Some of the molecular biology work we'll be doing here, you may have to just zoom in during some of those because we want to get people experience pre preparing libraries, doing flow cell loading, getting experience on the sequencing. So it's not just something you see on a screen or abstract, but something you get the chance to do. Also, can people hear me okay in Methodist or Zoom? I can hear you well. I don't know where the phone is, but as long as you can hear me good. I think there's some in the ceiling. Good. Okay. I'll talk as if speaking to a divine entity. And you can hear me. Great. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I can hear you as well. Yes, I can hear everybody. Great. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Anyone else need to do this survey? If so, and then do you want to review the results? Are they coming in? Oh, pretty good. Okay. I don't hearing no others. I think I'll jump in. Uh, so we want to do a few slides on uh, who we are, what we're doing here, uh, what we stand for, what we stand against, things like that. So I'm Chris Mason, as you probably guessed by now, professor of genomics, physiology, and biophysics here. And then they keep giving me other appointments because I think they just don't know what to do with me. So also other appointments uh, at the Brain Mind Research Institute, the Cancer Center, uh, and also still do some work um, at the law school on gene patents and intellectual property, which we won't talk about today, but it'll come up very last lecture about some of the um, real important questions in IP and in law uh, that that you'll you'll learn about, uh, which you didn't necessarily know you'd have for today, but you will. Uh, and we, let's go here. Here we go. Uh, and so single molecule sequencing is something uh, you can see that we've uh, been thinking about for quite a while uh, in my lab. This is something that we have been using for a while. You can see at least since uh, you know the the early teens. And, and looking at this question pretty consistently. So we it used to be uh, hard and expensive and difficult to get any single molecule sequencing. Uh, some of these papers here uh, with many collaborators, some of the very early versions of this technology, but things have uh, advanced quite quickly. And so I think what's exciting is we've been, uh, we actually at Cornell, actually the PAC Biosequencer, which we'll talk a little bit about later, was some of the first technology was developed in Ithaca and then commercialized through Pacific Biosciences. And we got one of the first machines here on campus. So we've been doing this. You can see some of these papers over the early part of the teens. But what you'll learn about a lot uh, in this course and in general, what we're going to spend some time on is for the single molecule sequencing using nanopore platforms. And there's a, a range of them uh, that exist. There's the one that's the most common and the one that's going to be the focus of the class is Oxford nanopore technology. So. You've all probably heard of Oxford Nanopore. It's probably why you're here. I would guess you saw the title of the course and either want to use it, have used it, or have dreams about it, maybe. I don't know what you dream about, but I dream about nanopores sometimes. Um, but so one fun fact, though, about Oxford Nanopore is this is there. Actually, you could use the mouse so people can see it. Uh, the, the, the It was not clear in 2012 or 13 what would be the best way to do nanopore sequencing. You can see here the goal is simple. You want to have something like CSGG or uh, MSA, different pores. There's known bacterial pores that allow a transit of a single molecule of DNA or RNA through. So the conceptually, David Deemer first wrote about this. The story is he was driving and had an idea and then pulled the side and drew it on a napkin. He still has the picture of it. Actually, if you ever see him give a talk about it, David Deemer. And this idea is simple. Like, what if you could have it be a, a pore and then you just measure the conductance change as, as, as nucleotides move through the pore? That alone would give you a signal that tells you, are we seeing a change that's relative to a specific base, an A, C, G, or T? And then look at this signal. And so, but when they, uh, they filed patents on both of these kind of ideas, one of them is you have something here, an exonucleus that chops one base at a time and one base falls through the pore and you look at the change. Is one idea that they had a patent on. The other one is called, they're called originally strand seed, where you have a motor protein that pulls essentially the DNA or RNA through, which is what ended up being commercialized and something that we'll see in, in some of the data and that you will see in the lab. And so we do, we've used a variety of these platforms. We focus a lot on the Prometheon 
And we focus on it, especially for this class, because you can get very, very long reads. You can't, it's not just a few molecules of DNA. You can actually get things that are really long reads. So there's actually, there's literally a website just about long read clubs. If you just want to hang out and think about long reads, you can go to longreadclub.org and just think about long reads, like really long reads. Like, yes, really very long reads indeed. This is the whole Twitter handle, or I should say X. Or if you tweet, if you tweet on X, are you are you Xing on X? Does anyone know? Are you tweeting on X? Are you Xing on X? What's the new one online? No, I don't know. Anyway, if you're if you're on X, uh, there's a, a, a handle for it as well. The, actually, the record is now that this was two megabase was first in 2018. In the past year, if actually the record has gotten up to, uh, I think it's so long. Go run, run forward here. Um, oh, no, no, jump back. Or I think it's in. Oh, it's not there. There's um another um a version I had a uh, four four point two megabases is the longest ever read. So it's four million bases, one molecule that's moved through the pore. It's extraordinary to think about not just hundreds or thousands, but millions of bases that have been pulled pulled through. And so the the way that that happens is you actually basically need to uh, you know, pull through essentially. Uh, really uh, carefully intact DNA. You have to slowly move the DNA, and we'll learn about that in the library prep part of the course. But if you want to get that to work, you do need to actually have you know, essentially, uh, you know, very carefully extract the DNA. So this has been uh, a pretty big revolution because it means you can sequence anywhere. You can sequence, for example, if you want in Antarctica. There's one of our friends and colleagues, Scott Ty, who's like, I'm going to go to Antarctica and bring a nanopore sequencer because you can bring it anywhere. This is the minion, which is this very small sequencer you can see here. It's really just a you know very tiny little sequencer you can put in your pocket, uh, and you can you can see we're even sitting like right next to the uh, you know Antarctic surface. You can see getting thousands of base pairs of reads. Actually, for this sample, the battery died before the the nanoport did because it got so cold, and so uh, that was the biggest challenge with this actually project. Funnily enough, and that means that so if you can do it in Antarctica in theory, we publish this. A bit. Uh, Sarah published this with Scott, and we've done some other characterization of it here. But in theory, you know, my spacefaring species, this is just a picture of me also talking, it's kind of, it's like a meta profile, I'm talking about myself talking. But one thing we did here is uh, we wanted to get this into space, but we didn't know if it would be possible to, to see how the sequence are working microgravity. So the first thing we did is said, well, let's try it actually on the parabolic flight, the zero gravity uh, plane called, some called the vomit comet, because you, most people puke. Uh, not everyone, but a lot of people. And we wanted to see, well, could we get this to work? I think it should work the embedding video here. Let's see. There's a video of, of Andy Feinberg trying to pipe pet. And he um, uh, he doesn't puke, but he gets very uh, distracted by flying tubes and tips. And so the hardest lab job ever is trying to pipe pet in zero gravity. But he did show we did 160 swoops in the zero gravity airplane, showed that it was possible, and showed that the nanopores are ready for liftoff uh, in 2016. And they were very fortunate that actually the next person going up into space was Kate Rubens, who was a trained virologist and then got them working actually in 2016 to do sequencing in space. And now it's part of the standard hardware on the space station. So the goal is this could be used on in space. This could be Antarctica. This could be in the moon, eventually Mars, because it, you could find non-standard nucleic acids or xenonucleic acids potentially uh, in those data. And this is you'll find more about that. And what happened uh, in in the next in lecture three? So to to be continued. The uh, and the other thing, I want to switch gears a bit here uh, more about some of the other uh, genomics uh, questions. And Teo, do you want to jump in? Uh, I get you. Right. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Hi everyone. I'm Teo. I'm a senior at Columbia University. Uh, next year, I'm going over to Cambridge as a Churchill Scholar. And my role in the Mason Lab is basically to take all of the data <laughs> generated from these nice minion and promethion sequencers and analyze it. And that's what I've been doing for one and a half years, for two years. And what I've found is all kinds of interesting questions that I hope throughout our labs and throughout our lectures that you'll be able to explore with me. And I think as hopefully the rest of this lecture will convince you of today, when you look at things from a single molecule perspective, it really opens up the possibility of questions and lets you think about science in a way that perhaps doesn't mold with the dominant sequencing practices of the time. So that's my little pitch. And now I have a little poll question, which is what is not single molecule sequencing? What technologies, what methods, what otherwise 
You can use the QR code and answer on your phone, or you can use the link that was sent to you via email. Or if you're looking at this on YouTube later, it'll be in the description. Okay. I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. All right. We're doing a bit of a back and forth here. So that, uh, so interesting to see that there is bulk sequencing is, uh, of course, not single molecule because there's many molecules, but also some of the imaging methods are normally not single molecule, although we'll show you an example at the end of today where you could argue there's a way you can both image and track single molecules potentially. So just saying imaging uh, depends on what kind of imaging. But um, but I want to take uh, everyone a little bit back and kind of focus what is the landscape of NGS technology? Because we're going to focus a lot on single molecule methods for DNA, for RNA, and for proteins for the course. But there, this has been built across a technology roadmap that's been you know, really years in the making. So in particular, uh, or really decades, decades in the making, most of you probably know that the first human genome, the draft was completed. And I, I really emphasize drafts, uh, 2001, where President Clinton got together with JGI and NIH investigators and Craig Venter and said, aha, we have completed a draft of the human genome. It only cost us $100 million in reagents, but probably $3 billion, $3 billion in supplies, chemistries, different sites. There were different labs that all they would do is say, hey, what are you in? I'm on the chromosome eight lab. And they would just focus on one chromosome and try to get enough data to assemble the chromosome. So it took a lot of time. And you can see here, it was, it was kind of clipping along at Moore's law, which is the density of transistors on a chip that increases compute capability capabilities. But every 18 to 24 months, it gets double, it doubles its density, which is extraordinary. And so most of you probably heard of Moore's law. Since the 1960s, it stayed pretty much constant. So that's a pretty good uh, log linear relationship of really fast technological change, the fastest technological change in the history of humanity. And we were tracking along quite well with that for the cost to come down. So it's not so bad. So actually the expectation was that at that rate that we get to a thousand dollar genome which starts to put it in the range of a medical test by about the year 2040 was what we thought we would get it uh, to have a thousand dollar genome but as you can see here uh, it went faster than that so here in the 2006 2007 range a lot of technology that was patented in the early 2000s began to be commercialized where instead of looking at one molecule at a time or through sanger which i'll show you shortly you could start to have you know, really millions or eventually billions of molecules and, and they sequence them all simultaneously. So what's called massively parallel sequencing. And so single molecule sequencing, you know, did not drive the last 10 years of the revolution. This has been mostly driven by short reads uh, generally, which I'll show you some um, many examples of the current platforms. Uh, you can see this, you know, this was driven really just by bulk sequencing, by massively parallel sequencing, or really you know, looking at generally many molecules at once and not a single molecule, but clusters of molecules. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second, if you don't know. But so this led to a lot of, you know, again, we thought about 2040, but then, you know, we got to about the thousand dollar genome. We want to bring the cost down by 2014. So everyone was very excited. And then we really got to about a hundred dollar genome, uh, you know, really just a couple of years ago. Now it's worth noting that Illumina said, we're going to get to a hundred dollar genome soon in 2017. And then their stock price went up and everyone was like, oh, it's coming soon. It's going to be, well, what does soon mean? It means next year, maybe two years, maybe it can't be more than three. But of course, that did not happen until really maybe 2022 is that we had multiple platforms that could then actually give you uh, a, a real you know, hundred dollar genome, at least in the reagent cost. You still have to pay for the instrument. You need people, you need computational support. Uh, so it's that's just the cost of the reagents. But Ultima Genomics is one of the companies that instead of having flow cells in a rectangle actually made sort of a disc. So actually they flow the reagents out along their, basically their small, like a CD, but no one remembers what a CD is anymore. But like, if you do remember what a CD is, uh, it was like a spinning disc, you drop the reagents in the middle, it flows outward and you can kind of see this, this image here. And so this was, again, this is many, many individual clusters where you take one piece of DNA, amplify it into a cluster. So you have hundreds or thousands of copies of this um, and actually, I might even show, because Ultima Genomics, I'll show you this in Illumina in a second, but each one of these is not just a single molecule. It's a clonally amplified one molecule. goes to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, 32, and is a cluster like this. And when you do the reaction, then you're looking basically at this whole cluster. Uh, so it's not a single molecule. It's many molecules, but they're from a single molecule clone. That's what you can see here. So, so it gets us to a cheap genome and a short genome. That's nice. And so, you know, this has now happened, but really, we, you know, I think... Single molecule sequencing will probably drive the next 10 years, uh, as you can see here, because you, you can get 
millions of bases. You can get to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bases. Uh, and you also get, I think the, the biggest reason it's, I'm the most excited about it with PAC Biorox or Danapore or others is you do get genetic information. You can see the, the nuclear bases that come through, depending on whether it's an ACG or T, the current profile is different. You're looking usually at five bases at a time as they move through the pore. And you can see this, the structure changes. Here's the current and the position. But you can also see modified bases. You see ACGT, but also the variations thereof. Do you see hydroxymethylcytosine, methylcytosine, 6-methyladenine? You see a, a, you know, a, a oxyvonazine. You see damaged bases. You can also see, in theory, pick up any modified base, damaged, epigenetically changed, moves through the pore. Uh, you can actually pick up quite well. And so the, this is in contrast to, you know, to answer the question of, you know, what is this more old school versus new school? Um, this is a very good album. If you want an album recommendation, it's just some kind of some trip hop, basically, and some rap albums. Anyway, the old school was the Sanger method. What was done, for, you know, getting several hundred to maybe a thousand base pairs uh, was a die terminator technology. I'll have a quick summary slide of that. But the new school is all these other methods that are really driving a, a lot more of the parallel sequencing. And eventually I'll get into what is the single molecule sequencing. So old school. And some of you, have any of you ever run Sanger? Any of you have done Sanger sequencing? Anybody online? Okay. Well, okay. Good. A couple people. Uh, sometimes you can send it out to GeneWiz. You probably don't even do it yourself anymore. You just send it to GeneWiz and it does it for you. Uh, there's services now that just do Sanger sequencing, but almost no one does it themselves anymore because you don't need to. But basically what you're doing here is you have, if you have a mixture, essentially you have your original DNA sequence that's usually you know, amplified. If you have enough, you can uh, get other versions of it, but either uh, amplified in some way and you have uh, DNTPs that are fluorescent labels. These are bases uh, that are ready to essentially bind to uh, and complete the complement uh, for where each one of your, essentially your template strand is. And the goal is to make it so that when you essentially have a, you know, basically have chain terminating DDNTP, so they're not DNTPs, they're dideoxy NTPs. They're nucleic, uh, they're triphosphate nucleotides, but they have a, a blocking agent. So you actually, you know, essentially, it won't go past one base of incorporation. So you have many, many fragments of your DNA from the original sequence, and you get kind of these different sizes that, in theory, are complementary to what is present, but only incorporate that one base. And then when you run them on a gel, you have large fragments and small fragments, and you look for these spikes. Like this. So in this case, this is what looks like what's called, we say it's like a, it's only a single copy. It's what haploid. But of course, you have two copies of every uh, piece of, of every gene because you have one from your mother and your father. So you'll see double peaks sometimes if you have essentially one of one base and one of the other from your mother and father. But for simplicity here, this just shows you see a spike of fluorescence depending on where you got essentially this base uh, from your original piece of DNA. And this gives you a way to get a chromatogram. You get maybe three, four, five hundred, up to about a thousand or eleven hundred. Uh, and then you can basically use this as a way to reassemble the genome. So this, you only get, you know, really uh, a handful of these, you know, so take days, you'd get, you know, a little bit of data. That's why there, there was, um, you know, many, many sites working together to stitch together chromosomes, the Sanger sequencing. But what's exciting is what that, you know, that led to some thinking of, well, if we have, you know, uh, you know dye deoxynucleotides or terminating dyes, if we could have a blocking agent that only allows one incorporated base and stops and then remove that and then repeat that cycle, that concept was sitting around for several years and then Illumina, what they did is what it was called this, um, you know, uh, massively parallel sequencing was, okay, let's take a DNA let's add some adapters on the five prime and three prime ends. So you basically take your sample, ligate these adapters. And then what you do is you take it and imagine you could lay it over a lawn of these sort of complementary uh, adapters on a flow cell. And as they stick somewhere, essentially you'll get this part where it sticks and do PCR. Normally you think of PCR in a tube where you basically make many copies of that target template and make two, four, eight, 16 copies but you can actually do PCR, what's called bridge amplification. So you actually change the chemistry, the pH a bit of the flow cell, you can change the temperature, and you can amplify kind of like a bridge, well, it's called the bridge amplification, and make this little loop. And then it goes from two to four to eight, 16, 32 molecules, 64, 128. Eventually you get these, these basically clusters that grow up, like making grass grow from one blade of grass to many. And then you have many, and so here you have two, but it started as one molecule, now it's a cluster of molecules, but then you get, you know, let's imagine you have millions of those clusters. And so every time you want to go one base at a time, you basically can say, okay, I want to see if I add a DNA polymerase and see what gets incorporated. It essentially has a blocking agent though. So it only incorporates one base, take a picture. Each one of the bases is colored with a different fluorescent dye. 
So it's one base, one die. Take a picture. You say, aha, I have an image, and it's either A, C, G, or T. All these different clusters, you can see, okay, I have all these clusters, and do one cycle. Then uh, you go, you basically cleave the blocking agent and then reincorporate the next round. And so it'll incorporate whatever's complementary. Then you have a G here. And you repeat this many, many cycles from it and you keep taking images. And if you keep your eye on the exact same cluster, it's kind of like stacking bricks. So basically sequence based on the complementary strand uh, as it's being synthesized. So it's often called sequencing by synthesis because you're synthesizing the complementary strand one base at a time. That itself is the sequencing, as you can see here. So this is the sequencing by synthesis reaction. And if you just keep your eye on each one of the bases, then you each cluster tells you a different base. Now, it started as first 25 nucleotides, then 30, then it eventually was 50, 100. Now you're getting these days hundreds of nucleotides. But it doesn't go much farther than that in terms of the length. And I'll show you why in a little bit, because it starts to accumulate too many errors. Uh, and some of it makes sense. Say you have a DNA polymerase, this enzyme. Maybe it only has a 1% error rate. It's not that bad. But if you have 100 bases, you should probably have at least one error. And the errors propagate more as you sequence farther along. Uh, so this is kind of the, the, the uh, basically the, the, the substrate and technology behind Illumina, which is so far the you know, sort of market leader, the one that is the most uh, machines uh, uh, essentially in the field and in clinical labs. That's how that reaction works. And now they've changed it over the time. Uh, have, again, this is their, their three prime uh, block reversible terminators where actually you can cleave these sites here to uh, basically unblock the reaction. So then you can add one more base. Now, this is what Illumina or was originally called Selexa did. Helicos did the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, incorporated and in, uh, commercialized the same concept of a single molecule of actually watching one molecule at a time. Uh, so this technically was a single molecule sequencer, although it uh, no longer exists as a company or exists in a way as a different subsidiary. But uh, that, that is another version of SBS, sequencing by synthesis. And it's also worth noting that Illumina has changed how they do the sequencing based on their lasers and what runs in their machines. It used to be simple, one color, one base. You just if you have four bases, you have four, four uh, dyes, you just pick which image you see in your color. But then Illumina realized they could save money on the dyes and also efficiency on the instrument. If you have two colors, think about this. What if, what if G is just always dark? If you just never see a color that tells you it's an unlabeled base, and you can actually have something, if you see two colors, you think it's, it's two bits of information, which gives you four types because it's, it's two bits gives you four states basically. So they realize well, if you have you know, one or the other or both is A and that lets you basically visualize there's two channel chemistry. Eventually there's an intermediate chemistry here that cleaves, but there's actually, you can even do with one channel in theory, you can get four bases if you have two steps. So again, you basically have two states uh, that they're there for one bit, which gives you effectively two bits and then four states. So no, no die ever is G. And if you see it twice in both reactions, you'll see T or the, uh, one of the others A and C. And so they have now four kinds of chemistry that they're using. Most of them are of these two these days. So it's kind of, it's interesting that as a concept, it was just simple at first, but they thought, well, we can, we can save money and make it more efficient if you do different, different kinds of chemistry, which is now on several of their machines. And then the other thing to note is they did do, um, you know, that, this thing about one end of sequencing, but if you think about it, you could actually linearize the molecule and do paired end sequencing, which some of you are probably nodding because you've seen this or you've worked with data and you will in this, uh, in this uh, class. But you can, you know, you can read your cluster from both ends to 300 or sometimes a little bit longer basis. But if you amplify the cluster like I showed you, you can cut there basically, and then linearize and pull up and then sequence the first strand. And you can then basically resynthesize the complementary strand again. And then you basically, uh, once you linearize it to you, then you make a second cut and you bring it back up again. And then that basically means you can then sequence the second read. But if you think of a double-stranded uh, piece of DNA, you're going to read the top of this part and then on the three three prime, basically on the other end is another five prime in this sense. So you're seeing uh, both are pair of these reads. And then uh, Teo actually has, is a YouTube channel of just make the brain happy. How did you pick make the brain happy as a YouTube video? Oh, I mean, that was all the way back in sixth grade. Okay. Fifth grade, I started my first website. I named it learning.com. I thought it was the most unique name that, um, but it turns out somebody else had taken that. Right. So I thought of unique names and Make the brain happy was what I landed with. That's good. good. Wait, do you have make the brain happy.com as your? I do. Okay, good, good. So, in there, also the YouTube channel are a number of videos about sequencing, RNA sequencing, RNA modifications. So, I highly recommend it. We're also going to put all these on the YouTube channel. We can put it on yours or we'll make one for the class. But, um, uh, in any case, there's a good video, a great video here on, on how you think about paradigm sequencing, which I want to point people to. And also, just visually, this is another way to show when you're looking at the long molecule on the flow cell. 
uh, you can get read one or read two, but you can see they're coming from blunt ends. But there also are index reads. So when you think about the blunt end fragment of DNA and you ligate adapters, you can also, in a different part of the reaction, ligate a barcode of these index reads, which can be anywhere from some of them are eight. Some people have done 12 or 16 nucleotide barcodes. So that means if we all want to sequence our genome in this room, if we just mix our DNA together, we can't tell who's who. But if in each well of a plate, I add a barcode, a unique barcode to each person, then you can pool all the DNA together in one flow cell and just read through the barcode that tells you who, which sample came from which person. It's called indexing. That is now pretty, pretty common and pretty standard. Uh, so that's Illumina, which is uh, very well established, very common. But I'll walk you through a couple of the more emerging technologies. So one of them here, let's see if this works here, um, is called sequencing by expansion. So Stratos was bought by Roche, and uh, Roche may commercialize that this year. Rumored, we'll see if what actually happens, but they're having an event in a month to talk about uh, their nanopore high accuracy sequencer, so it'll probably be this. But this purchase happened almost uh, almost 10 years ago, and this was more recently. So it's um, nanopore sequencing in this case. In this case, it's single molecule, but kind of a, I uh, see here, a funky single molecule. So it's still a single molecule going through, but they've added all these basically reporters between each base. So again, kind of as a concept, is a fascinating way to think, okay, if, if signal and noise is the problem, let's create these kinds of structures to then pull them to the pore, which is a very unique way to, to think about how you do the sequencing. Uh, there are other sequencers on the market, though. One, for example, is the BGI. There's a T7 you can see here. It was first announced in 2018. Uh, and does anyone remember, is the T7? Does anyone remember the T1000 Terminator? Terminator 2? Does anyone remember this movie? Okay, I got a couple nods. That's great. Usually no one knows what I'm talking about. But when they came out with the T7, I was like, is soon going to be the T1000? Because he was a bad Terminator. Anyway, um, there is, they do have some, uh, they had some updates also to the kinds of their sequencing uh, with these MGI seq platforms. And they have some of the larger systems that are now actually uh, in Shenzhen and uh, near Beijing where they can actually do, in theory, you know, a thousand sequencing labs and a thousand genomes a day. They have, this came up at a meeting last year where they said, we could just sequence everyone everywhere on the planet all at once, which I don't know what, what they're going to do with that, but it's something I've talked about, you can see here. Uh, and so they're another, very much like Illumina, so not single molecule, but I want to mention them. And they also are uh, more common in Europe. There's also the new kid on the block. See, it's called, so this is something called uh, Avity Sequencing. Mm -hmm. of, a, of a massively parallel sequencer that's not single molecule, but you can see it's one molecule that's then amplified to give you enough signal. The reason they do this, the reason Illumina does this, and MGI, is with one molecule, it's very hard to see. You either need to make an expandomer. Or, or somehow get enough signal, or if you expand it and have many copies of it, it just gives you more signal to see what base you have. So it's really the reason this is often known as for chemistry, uh, signal to noise, oh, we'll see. Okay, and this is another image of their surface anchored amplification sites where you can see them. And a quick slide also of how this works. And so often it's the hybridized DNA that attaches to these surface primers. And it's a, it's so this avid is a, as I just told you, it's a dilabeled polymer with multiple nucleotide arms that have the same base. And they have different colors, one for each base. And when you wash them, it leaves only the avidites that are bound to these these polys, these collections, these colonies of a clonally amplified, basically uh, rolling circle amplification, no, uh, basically template. And then once you detect the bases, you can then remove the blocks, and then basically the reversibly terminated nucleotides. We see these again, uh, and then you basically remove the avidites after you've done this uh, re uh, reversible terminator. Uh, cleaving, and then you proceed to the next cycle, and you do that for hundreds of cycles. So this is the workflow for the avidite. So again, we won't be doing it too much in this course, but I want you to just know what what's what are the technologies that are out there. We've been using a lot of these in lab for various projects. So, um, so one thing to think about, I've kind of been alluding to this a little bit, but you can see, you know, each platform has its own source of noise and thus error. So for example, there's something called dephasing, but let's say you think you incorporate one base, but you actually grab two. Let's say the, the enzyme has a issue, has a problem. No enzyme is perfect. Some of them have a one in a hundred error, some of one in 10,000, but it, you can have what's called lagging strand dephasing. So you think that you've incorporated, but you didn't, the enzyme just didn't quite make it. So then you, you'll be one base off or leading fan dephasing. You might incorporate two bases instead of one or zero instead of one. And so this is something that you'll see with uh, enzymes, but you'll also see it a lot with technologies where you uh, like like ion torrent, or where you're expecting one burst of signal that is equivalent of one base or double the signal for two bases. 
you have what's called the homopolymer, the same uh, same basic but pairing multiple times. Uh, you can have dark nucleotides. If you think you have a labeled base, but the label falls off, that means you'll incorporate the base, but you won't see it. So this is something else to consider. You can also, as I said, every enzyme has imperfections. You'll just have errors that happens. And you can also, one of my favorite things about single molecule challenges, if you think about it, you have this piece of DNA floating like this in solution. So you can get what's called the wiggling uh, from the tail, where actually there's motion in, in basically entropy. As it's moving through the pore, it's actually moving around, which creates creates noise that you have to track. And every platform just has its slightly uh, distinct errors. Illumina, others, uh, Avid, the element systems, and PCR methods, if you have very low or very high AC or genomes, PCR doesn't always amplify those genomes equally. So these are all you know, basically things to consider, uh, I think, for uh, what are some of the sources of error. And I think we'll switch over to, oh, yeah. Um, any other single molecule uh, sequencing? Anyone has any other comments on single molecule methods? Or online as well, we can see the chat here. So we're going to focus, this is the first lecture. We're talking a lot about nanopore sequencing. And I, I wanted to give you some of the, the breadth in the, uh, in the previous section, but we're going to focus a lot on nanopore sequencing to really give you a deep uh, analysis of nanopore uh, tools and methods and, and data. And the main goal is because, you know, you could do a survey of all of them, but there's many technologies in the market. I think you, you should know about them and be mentally familiar with them, but you do all to become uh, fluent and really, you know, I think have good acumen with nanopore sequencing. One, because if you're going to go to the moon, you might use it there. Uh, two is because it is a long read platform that has a lot of legs, a lot of development capability. It also does something called adaptive sampling, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. It has these other unique features that I think make it a great platform. Uh, and it's a great and it's very portable. So you could bring it into the subway or wherever you might like uh, next. And so um, and I think you're are you coming in the later section. Is it here? Is it? Uh... Sure. Yes. The idea of this slide just being that there's many ways to abstract a certain concept. And so the way that the course is built, five lectures, five labs is for the lectures to really be devoted on these concepts, going through the general things. There's a lecture every two weeks. And then for the labs to go into these more detailed levels and designs. Just out of curiosity, how many people have some kind of programming experience? Could you raise your hands? both on Zoom and on. So a lot of this will be taking those concepts and applying them into different nanopore specific contexts. And one of the things that you'll learn about is that since it's commercialized and proprietary, there's different ways that the company tries to sort of protect its trade secrets and patents and all of that. And a lot of it also has to do with how this signal data is interpreted. So it's very difficult to get access to sort of those, those raw signals, those raw files, to understand them, to deconvolute them. It's much, much easier just to accept sort of the FASTQ files that the base caller reads out, you know, similar to how the Illumina, it just produces FASTQ files automatically. How many people actually know what a FASTQ file is and the structure of it? Um, but, you know, that's sort of the standard that everyone's been familiar with, starts to work with, and so any cases, you just sort of take the fast queue and, and run with it. But as we mentioned, right, the promise of these single molecule sequencing platforms is in that signal data as in, and is in the electrical signal data. And so if you imagine sort of how you're going to go through this tree of abstractions, it's applying a lot of the skills that you might have developed in other projects, programming and otherwise, as both wet lab and dry lab. And sort of applying that to the this, what I would say is an untapped landscape of opportunities. So how is the course gonna be organized? How are we gonna go through it? These first two weeks are sort of an introduction, one to the course and what single molecule sequencing is per lecture. And then next week, sort of putting everyone, hopefully on some kind of similar footing as to how typically bioinformatic programming and interfacing will work in this class You'll need a Google account. Um, I'm going to send a, a little notebook later this week just to make sure that before you come into lab, you've got you know your Google account set up for for this format that you can connect to your files, that you can you know import any data that we want to give for pre-processing or otherwise. But that's the introduction, and then the rest of it is kind of built as the central dogma is looking at DNA. DNA modifications, long read seek applications in the context of DNA for two weeks, and then going into the lab and practicing 
extractions, bio, biochemistry techniques, and trying to connect what the assumptions are from the lab that you might be making to the later bioinformatic analysis. People think that they're kind of two separate worlds, but oftentimes, you know, the two of them interface in a way. And to account for your experimental design is an important skill. Third sort of section is going to be RNA. Um, and Nanopore in particular is very exciting because it has the capability to directly read RNA and as such is the only platform that can call RNA modifications and those epitranscriptomic changes. Lab will focus on how to prepare an RNA sequencing library, what the sequencer actually looks like, loading the sequencer, and trying to sort of demystify everything around that process. This fourth part of the course is going to incorporate a lot of guest lectures focusing on single cell, proteomic, spatial. There's a lot of terms, keywords, and such. And people at this stage are trying to merge the different technologies together. So what can you do if you have a single cell and a long single cell library, but you run it on a long read platform, or you have a spatial library and you run it on the long read platform, what are the considerations? What's the kind of data that you can get as output, everything, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as I mentioned, right, the labs are sort of building on these explorations of signal data, these an analyses. And by the end, what we hope is that you'll have explored enough single molecule data and we'll, we'll give some from the lab that we've been generating kinds of interesting technical questions that we've been looking at. And you'll have the samples that you sequenced yourself in this section of the course to write your own posters, present on both the course content and everything that you're excited to explore in the future. And so the last session, the 10th session on June 4th, will be a poster presentation. And the poster assignment, just if you like putting dates in your calendars for big times, I put my midterms and finals and everything else, is May 31st for when that poster should be in our inboxes, yes. And one other fun fact for the RNA sequence struck experiment I think for the email from Ariana, we're gonna probably do uh, the some of the, you use query foot and snub cells for Elephant IPFCs, which we'll be used for cloning the woolly mammoth eventually and helping that project. So there's a project partnership with Colossal Biosyn. Just because if we're going to sequence something, we might as well contribute towards a characterization of a new cell type. And that could also be something we could all contribute towards for a paper. Because uh, why sequence a random thing when we could see, sequence something interesting? So that would be the data. First elephant direct RNA sequencing yeah, sample. So that's what this class can be known for. Yeah, it's right. So <laughs> every year we'll try and do something. We said, when we get the mammoth, we could do that, but that's going to be a ways off. <laughs> there's, but there's also some other de extinct species that will be announced this year that we use for next year's class, but they're confidential for now. But they're coming. And we'll start with elephant IPFCs for long. So yes, wet and dry lab components, and I, so I, I've done both, and it's exciting, and I think it's very informative for people's experiences. I also wanted to put a quick note on ChatGPT. It will also be in the syllabus, but I generated the you know research Chris Mason superhero thing with it, and it's great for in context learning. So a lot of the coding assignments and such will encourage you to make graphs and other things just in chat GPT and, and with this style. Although I should ask, how many people sort of regularly use this now for their for their research and for their work? And you specifically for coding. So about so about half the class. Yeah. So this is gonna hopefully and the way that the assignments are going to be designed and built is meant to sort of facilitate the use of chat GPT for this in context learning. And hopefully you'll find that it's more efficient. It allows you to ask biological questions easier and ultimately makes the whole process smoother. So the class has, you know, when you look at different kinds of research and different components of research, there's a lot of ways to set up an experiment, a lot of different ways to set up a question. So this is sort of a reminder of the difference between you know, different kinds of exploratory research where you look at a whole bunch of data that's been pre-generated a more confirmatory research where you have a result and you go through the experimental design. Many, many single molecule technologies, when they start, when they come up, they're answering or they're designed for specific questions within 
confirmatory research. And then only as those technologies mature, they ultimately become sort of elements of exploratory research. So some of the first examples that we'll go through of single molecule bona fide, those will be elements of confirmatory research. But as we keep going through our labs and as we keep going through the course and the lecture, you'll see that it'll shift more into that exploratory research focus where you know, you'll get data and it might not even be necessarily related to the biological question, but more of the technical question of what does you know, signal data look like from two different flow cells? Or what does signal data look for, like from different versions of the same sequencing platform, which maybe aren't as immediately interesting as the biological questions, but definitely important for grounding the assumptions that we're making about the various predictions, calls, accuracies, et cetera. So where to start? I guess 1665 is pretty good cells. This gets at the question of why single molecule lets you ask unique questions. What makes it interesting? What makes it observable? Because you know, when Robert Hooke looked through a microscope and he saw single cells for the first time, he was able to all of a sudden ask so many more questions about what life is. Not just people thinking, oh, you know, the human body is one liquid or one porous thing or he saw cells and now could ask many, many questions about it, such as one of the first was, why are there all of these you know, big circles within the walls of the cells, right? The nuclei, et cetera, et cetera. Very similar story of viruses being a single particle discovery before the early 1930s, before 1940, there was a heated debate over whether virus particles were just liquid or whether they actually had some particulate constituent. And when they saw the first virus particle in 1940 and this electron microscope graph was generated, that's what really confirmed for the scientific community that these are in fact particulate elements that can be targeted and otherwise. And then this rest of the panel shows how, that te how those technologies have um, improved and, you know, different kinds of shapes and questions that can be asked about those initial bacteriophages. So I invite you to also, I came up with now some of the questions that you can ask looking at this viewpoint, looking at this modality. I invite you to also think with me of, of other questions, but what is inside a cell or a virus now that we have a defined structure for which to explore? How do viruses and cells determine their structures? How do viruses and cells interact and signal information between these different structures? What differences are observed between these different cells, virus particles, morphologically, chemically, or otherwise? What differences are observed between different cell virus types based on their origin? All of these are unlocked, all of these and many more are unlocked by the capacity to see things as a single entity. And at least in these cases, their discovery really changed how biology was done, opening up the field of microbiology, opening up the field of virology to serious exploration. Right now, we've gone through many technologies, Illumina, as mentioned, the dominant, that discuss sort of the way that this genomic DNA is broken up and allow you to ask all kinds of really exciting questions. If I have different populations of people, right, do they have different RNAs or do they have different DNA profiles or do they have different SNP profiles based on this sequencing data? If I look at various environments and bacterial species and metagenomes, how are all those changing based on time, place, spatial location? You can look at individual questions within sort of which you believe are representative of a population of cells, such as which DNAs might interact with each other, which RNAs might interact with each other. Those encompassing are many of the dominant questions that currently drive sequencing-based research, either looking at a single protein complex RNA type across large populations of cells that then get compared to each other. And even in the case where you're looking at single cell, all of the various 
pieces of RNA, DNA molecules within the single cell are separated from each other and then amplified before being interrogated with one of these questions. And there's many, many cases of how you can use this approach, scale it up, and be thereby deliver novel results. So looking at not just three genomes, four genomes, however many you have the sequencing budget for, but collaborating, getting 100,000 genomes, and scaling up to answer population-wide questions. Or even in this example, um, that novelty, right, actually has a real clinical impact and a translational impact. This has definitely, right, been driving innovation. This has been very important over the last 10 years. But this element, these kinds of questions are what I argue not a part of single molecule sequencing, They're not the lens, or not similar or comparable to the examples that I mentioned with cells and viruses. Fundamentally, they're different kinds of questions. And even, yes, in all of the different characterizations of the different kinds of genes, it's based on these bulk populations. And so the way that you characterize the genes themselves is based on you know, the assumption that these various genes act in similar manners across populations of cells, and that there isn't necessarily variability between those that drives their function. Genes themselves, right, in that case, are abstractions of transcript variants that span various different alternative splicing patterns, mRNAs, et cetera, et cetera. And Chris has this very nice plot that shows, you know, just how the definitions of genes, transcripts, and the discovery of those within even new long-read RNA sequencing data sets is changing that particular landscape. Would you like to mention all of your books? Yeah, I might, I might jump in for a few slides if you will. So, yeah. yeah, this is, well, one thing is you often hear some people say, yeah, there's 20,000 genes in the human genome. Like how many, so how many genes are there? But if I ever hear any of you say that, I will tackle you. <laughs> there are at least 60,000 annotated genes in the human genome. Now, there are 20,000 protein coding genes. That's a true statement. But there are, and that's stayed pretty flat since 2010. We have not found any more protein coding genes in the human genome. I think we found them all. There's pretty much nothing left. But non-coding RNAs, pseudogenes, uh, we keep finding more of them as we sequence deeper rare cell, rare isoforms and rare cells. We'll probably find another, I don't know, five, 10,000 long non-coding RNAs or non-coding RNAs in the next 10 years, I would guess. But but yeah, because you you, this will happen to all of you. You'll be interviewed by a reporter. You'll be at Christmas. Your grandma will ask you, oh, are you studying genes? Yeah, I'm studying genes. So, well, how many genes are there? Oh, there's like, oh, 60,000. At least 60,000 is the answer. And don't anyone ever say 20,000. Um, but this is just a plot uh, from one of my books. It just kind of shows the trend over time. But it's still going up. The gen code genes, the most official annotation for men code and gen code. It's now, I think it's 61,000. And I think the other, next slide. Okay. oh, and then the other thing I make the point of is you can sequence deeper. You keep find, finding new species because we can go in the environment and find do assemblies and sequence and find new species. And this is a projection of how many new species we're likely to find over the next 10, 20 years. You can see for almost all clades of life, we'll likely find more because you can sequence cheaper and find them. Except for birds, we probably will not find any more birds. Birds are like the coding RNAs of the animal kingdom. <laughs> There's no more to be found. I think they're big and they're kind of slow. Uh, I have a snap. Yes. Um, the, the, uh, the central dogma, I think most of you know, is DNA, RNA, protein. Uh, so most of you, have, of course, thought of, we'll have a more discussion of this in the uh, in some later lectures, but you all thought before of DNA, RNA, protein as the central dogma of molecular biology, like this, uh, as what we tell also our friends and family. But there are many other kinds of RNAs that guide, say, transcription, obviously translation, like tRNAs. But there are also, there's DNA transposons that can copy. There's not that many active left in the human genome, only maybe one, PGDP5. Uh, but there are, of course, um, you know, you can have reverse transcriptase that moves information backward. Of course, Crick wrote a version of this back in the 50s, 1950s. There's also RNA dependent, like basically uh, ribosome binding proteins that essentially could modify the RNA. Uh, ribozymes can copy themselves. Like you might think that. You know, it's weird to have DNA copy itself, but but RNAs do this with ribozymes. Prions do this. The prions, you know, they copy each other and could just touch a protein and it becomes the other protein, which I think is kind of creepy. But if you think 
it's creepy, but it, there's other parts of the center of dogma that are also creepy. So if you think that's creepy, the whole thing's creepy. I guess you have to just be creeped out. Or I'm kind of creeped out. Is anyone else creeped out by prions? Anybody? They're kind of creepy, right? Yeah, like they just touch and changes. And I, I don't know what's happening there, but it's it happens elsewhere too. Uh, but now there's the epigenome, which is the regulatory layer behind DNA and how it's packaged and modified. The epitranscriptome, which we'll hear about in a couple of weeks, is the landscape of RNA modifications, of which there are many. Um, to be consistent, all post-translational modifications, we should call the epiproteome, but nobody calls it that. We all call it the post-translational modifications. Epiproteome does appear in PubMed like 10 times total. It is, some people have said it, but nobody uses it. But I think to be consistent. How many times have you said it? Uh, probably more than exists in PubMed. I'd just like to point out, if you were consistent, we'd call it that, but nobody does. But then there's also inherited DNA can, of course, be moved between generations. Uh, and you can even, uh, I like to think of this also with the, the facial, the uh, Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease, where they can transmit DNA between each other, like a contagious cancer, which is interesting. Uh, there's viral induced microRNAs that can be transmitted through generations for C. elegans. If you've never heard of Oded Rachavi, very fascinating. And then, of course, prions, you can go from, you know, uh, Jacob, you know, you can go to mad cow disease and give it in between species which also just adds to the creepiness. I'm trying to creep you out by the central dogma, basically. <laughs> this was a, a version of the central dogma I redid in 2012, and it still covers most of it, but it's obviously much more complicated. So I just want, to, want everyone to think, when you think of, oh, it's DNA, RNA, protein, and of course it has many, many other flavors. And then I think we'll switch back to you. Oh yeah, well, we'll talk more about this. Or do you want to do this next section? Or I can... yeah, sure. uh, so there's many variations of this, and let's see, I made this slide, so I want to comment on that and then a couple more slides I think, I think as we've gone through right yeah. Yeah, yeah these two different comparisons one is there's a way that people do sequencing based research that has had real clinical and medical impact where you look at different populations and groups of either cells patients etc cetera, etc cetera. on the other hand the way that the central dogma is constructed and every observation that we've made about it from there suggests that on the individual level, when you look at an individual transcript and genes just being a summarization of hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of transcripts, that each of those individual transcripts can have its own chemical state based on you know, 100 types of epigenome modifications, 140 types of different modifications within that um, RNA molecule, that epitranscriptome, 400 different types of modifications for the post-translation modifications. And if you just multiply that 100, 140, 400, you get that there's 5,600,000 permutations, which for the first time are becoming measurable with these single molecule sequencing technologies. So ultimately, how do we sort of integrate this potential right into all of the medical science, the liturgy that we've become accustomed to, and that we've, I guess, grown up in. So inspired perhaps by the questions of cells, viruses, anything else you've heard or, or just your own ideas, it'd be great if you could log in um, either with this QR code or with the form link that I sent you per email and answer the question, what questions could you ask of a single molecule? Yeah, so one question, you know, what questions can you ask of single molecule sequencing? One example that we came up with was looking at this live cell imaging of single viral RNA molecules. So what they've done here is they've designed a specific system and platform. And if you look at this particular video, and if you look at the videos in the paper, what you see is that there's a single dot, which corresponds to the RNA from a single virus, and then that multiplies within a cell itself, exits the membrane of the cell into the extracellular space, and then you can really watch a single molecule go in, infect another cell, and start the process all over again. These fluorescent-based approaches to visualizing single molecules and understanding their movement, again, fall back into that pattern of confirmatory research where you have a very specific target and a specific system and you're watching and modeling it. And so there's two different, uh, you know, the video that you just saw was of the sun tag approach, which basically modifies the genome of the specific virus of interest to add these sun tag specific nucleotides where 
um, these basically amino acid sequence that can be hybridized to a specific antibody. And that basically relies on the fact that you have many ribosomes translating the same viral strand. You have the sun tag at the beginning, and then basically you get a fluorescent signal from the combination of all of the antibodies binding to all of the different ribosomes that you're getting. And in that way, boom, single RNA molecule detection. That's a little bit different from SM fish, which basically relies on specific oligonucleotides that are complementary to your target of interest, any RNA, DNA target of interest. And you can take these probes. They have specific sequences on the end of them. They're these CAG six C, well, six means it's repeated six times C. They can bind to this specific dye that can then be visualized. And you can simultaneously with one of these platforms visualize all of these specific hybridized sequences. And then if you want to track many, many single molecules across genes, you create a library of oligonucleotides um, with different colors that you can track, and you can do that for 12 genes, 15 genes, and scale up that way. But again, both of these approaches, as with many fluorescence-based approaches, require you to sort of know what your target genes of interest are or what your system looks like, or what these oligonucleotides are, or have it all pre-engineered. As such, right, they necessarily don't fall into the categories of high throughput sequencing and research that is typical in the Mason lab and is, you know, widely um, also utilized, but at least we wanted to introduce them, these specific kinds of single molecule techniques, because if you want to really watch something happen in, in live action, and you want to think of it the way that Robert Hooke did the first time he sat down and looked at a cell. These kinds of approaches, I think, make it very visualizable, or at least very pretty videos to watch. So how does SM Fish maybe take a story or a narrative for how a specific interaction works? that might have been characterized with other sequencing-based methods or, or otherwise, how does it take that knowledge and change the kinds of questions that are being asked? This is just an example um, regarding the role of IL-18, interleukin-18, in neurons to protect against bacterial infection. This is a review from 2019, which summarized a lot of the existing literature based on bulk RNA-seq, based on studies, Western blots, qPCRs, et cetera, et cetera. And in essence, they isolated different cell types, as you can see. They looked at the way each of those responded to various cytokines, what the inputs are of the system, what the outputs are for those cell populations. And in the end, diagrammed and built a model for how IL-18 fit into all of that pre-existing data. This study in 2020, so just six months later, looked at IL-18 again, but instead they used the context of these SM fish molecules, and they were basically able to track in real time how IL-18 was moving through the cells, what it was, the specific genes, because they knew what the targets were, what it was producing, where those were going, and in the end, they were able to create a model that explained how IL-18 worked with these neurons right inside of the mucosal wall and sent its products all the way out past the mucosal membrane, which is actually where and how they were interacting with these bacteria, and which is actually how they were able to um, defend against bacterial infection. So not just the question of, you know, we, we sort of know what this does, and we know what its targets are, and we have an idea of what the phenotype is, but a specific spatial location within the body and a specific model and orientation for how these single molecules track, go through, and end up exhibiting the target. Great. So in summary, we've gone through the first piece, which is next generation sequencing, how that's powered the last 10 years of innovation, allowed for a greater breadth, and underscored population scale questions. We've examined how single molecule sequencing has the potential to change the kinds of biological questions that we can ask as it relates to our view of what the transcriptomic stage or the 
what, what the state of an individual transcript could be. Three, we've looked at the discovery of cells and viruses, how those generated their own biological fields, again, in the context of how single molecule sequencing could do the same. And then we looked at some fluorescence-based visualization approaches for single molecule sequencing, specifically SunTag and SMFished, which provide avenues for confirmatory-based research. Next time, we're going to look at some of the data formats that underlie single molecule sequencing, review the computational elements, and begin to play around with the signal data that underscores more high throughput approaches that we'll be looking at in the rest of the course for single molecule sequence. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to a great semester. And yeah, we're happy to take any questions. Yes, before, yeah. before we all yeah. hop out, if you could fill out the exit ticket, it's got a question. And if there's any feedback that you have about the first lecture that you want to put in, very much appreciate it. And yeah, thanks online. Good luck in, uh, we'll see you online as well, Methodist. We've got so many to get that.